Looks like today someone's going to use bacteria to grow some protein for them. We can overexpress proteins in bacteria, which means we can get a lot, a lot, a lot of protein um, from bacteria, assuming that the bacteria are okay with making it for you. So right now what you'll see, so in this shaker incubator, this is a starter culture. So it's just a small flask and you're letting the bacteria grow enough and then um, you're going to stick it in bigger flasks like this in a bigger shaker incubator and let the bacteria grow and grow and make the protein. Um, and we can use this cool inducible system where we don't um, have the bacteria make the protein until we add something called IPTG. Um, and this lets us build up lots and lots of bacteria before we tell them to make our protein so that they don't spend all their energy making our protein and but you only have like a few cells because you didn't want them to grow. You take the genetic recipe for protein, stick it into a circular piece of DNA called a plasmid, and use that plasmid as a vector or vehicle for putting it into bacterial cells that will um, make the protein for you. So the back the genetic code is universal. So no matter you can stick the recipe in any type of cell and it should be able to make it. And bacteria are really great because they grow really fast and their food is really cheap um, and we can control them really easy, easily genetically. All we need to do is get the genetic instructions inside and the bacterial protein making machinery can take over from there. So just a little bit of terminology. So the gene, what we're actually putting in isn't the gene, it's the cDNA or complementary DNA. So basically you have a gene which is in DNA. Then a messenger RNA copy of that gene gets made in a process called transcription. And that copy gets edited um, through splicing which removes regulatory regions called introns and it also gets this cap in the tail which aren't as relevant here. But basically you get this edited copy of that gene and you can make lots and lots of copies of this so that you can make lots and lots of protein because you only have that one original copy or one per chromosome in the case of humans or and other um, organisms that have two copies. Um, but basically, so you can make lots of copies of this mRNA and then pass it over to the protein making complexes called ribosomes. So the more co mRNA copies there are, the more um, that they can compete for the limited number of ribosomes. So there are a lot of ribosomes, but there's also a lot of mRNA. So you want to really chalk it up and make as much mRNA as you can in order to make as much protein as you can for when you're trying to overexpress, which is what we're doing um, with bacterial expression typically. Um, so how do we do this? How do we compete with all those bacterial mRNAs? The way that we commonly do this is with a T7 expression system. So T7 is a bacteriophage, or typically just called a phage, and it's a virus that infects bacteria. And scientists have figured out how to use um, use some of the machinery from phages to help us hijack bacterial cells to do what we want. So the phages want have this machinery to do hijack the cells to do what they want, but we want to hijack the bacteria to do what we want. So we can do this by taking, um, taking some of the T7 phage machinery and using it to our advantage. So T7 uses so if we remember we talked about before we had transcription whereas when we take make an RNA copy of DNA and that involves a molecule called an RNA polymerase Tip, uh, technically it's a DNA dependent RNA polymerase so the it knows what to copy because there's a sequence called a promoter in front of it so that the bacterial strains we're usually using are E. coli strains um, harmless versions so though, don't worry. Um, and so E. coli has its own RNA promoter. So it has this specific sequence that its RNA polymerase will recognize and make mRNA copies of genes. T7 is a little tricky. Um, 
Well, it's, it's a little trickster. So what it does is it has its own RNA polymerase and its own promoter. So it has a different promoter sequence that its RNA polymerase will recognize. So this means that even when the E. coli so RNA polymerase isn't making mRNA, so when the bacteria is not making its own proteins, uh, the, the T7 could still be getting the bacteria to make its proteins. Because the, so you can shut down the bacterial RNA um, transcription, but the T7, it has its own pr T7 promoters and its own T7 RNA polymerase, so it can keep making mRNA. And thus the bacteria will keep making the protein. Um, and so in bacteria, so in our cells, we have our genes are, and our chromosomes are kept in a membrane-bound compartment called the nucleus. Um, and then the mRNA copies are taken out into the cytoplasm, which is a general cellular in interior, um, and that's where the ribosomes are. We don't have to worry about that with bacteria. They don't have that membrane-bound nucleus. Because bacteria don't have that membrane-bound nucleus like our cells do, everything's kind of happening all together in the cytoplasm. So you have transcription and translation coupled. So the RNA polymerase is making the copies, and then the ribosomes are making the protein directly from that um, mRNA as it's made. So there's really this direct relationship between the mRNA and the protein making. So if we can get as much mRNA as we can of our gene, then we can get as much protein as we can. So that might sound like a really, really good thing, and we call it overexpression. But timing, timing, timing. It's all about timing. Because bacteria need to make their own proteins. And if you, they need to make different proteins at different times and that sort of thing. But they need to make a lot of proteins in order to grow um, and multiply. And we need to think about bacterial growth when we're trying to think about how much protein we're going to get. So if you have a lot of bacterial cells making a lot of your protein, you're going to get a lot of protein. But if you only have a few bacterial cells, even if they're making a lot of your protein, you're not going to get much protein because you don't have many bacterial cells. So you need to make sure that the bacteria can still grow enough that you can get enough bacteria before you tell them to stop making their own um, proteins and switch to making almost entirely yours. So with overexpression, you can get like 50% of the proteins um, that the bacteria makes to be your protein, which is awesome, unless it means that the bacteria can't grow. So basically, what we typically want to do is let the bacteria grow enough that um, we can get a large stock so we're like building our workforce and then we're going to put them to work instead of just hiring a few people and putting them to work but not hiring any more people. So in order to do this, we control when T7 RNA polymerase is expressed. So when we're doing the cloning step, we actually use cells typically that don't even have the TN T7 polymerase gene. Um, and then we don't have to worry about T7 polymerase getting made at all. And we can just focus on getting lots of the plasmid um, so we can check that the sequence checks out and everything. And so you can look at our molecular cloning um, video for more details on that process. But we're going to skip forward to where we know we have the right... Um, plasmid and what we're going to do is we stick it into a different type of cell so we stick it into expression cells like BL21 um, and these cells have the T7 polymerase gene in them under this lac repressor system. So basically this lac repressor is this system that bacteria use to control when they make a molecule called beta galactosidase or beta gal um, which is an enzyme that breaks down the molecule lactose. And so bacteria don't want to make this molecule if there's no lactose around, or if there's not much lactose and there's plenty of glucose, which is easier to use, and they prefer that. So if there's a lot of lactose around, some of it gets um, changed into this molecule called allolactose. And then allolactose binds to this lac repressor that's sitting in front of the gene for making beta-gal. So when, that, when the allolactose binds, the repressor falls off and the beta-gal gets made. 
So why am I telling you all this? Because we can put that lac repressor in front of the gene of um, the T7 polymerase gene. And it, we, instead of adding lactose or allolactose, we add this molecule called IPTG, which mimics allolactose. And when you add IPTG, you derepress the repressor, so you bind to that um, lac repressor, it falls off, and you can get expression of your T7 RNA polymerase. So when you have it uninduced, so before you add the IPTG, the bacteria can just grow normally, um, and it's not going to make the T7 polymerase, so it's not going to make your protein. When you induce it, then the T7 gets derepressed, um, and so the T7 control gene is transcribed and translated, um, and so you get your protein of interest. Um, so you might be wondering why we use different cells for the um, expression and for the cloning, and there are some different reasons, including how much of um, like the DNA you can get versus the protein, um, and also that these the repression isn't it can be leaky, so you can still get some uh, a little bit of your protein made even when the cells aren't um, actively making protein and stuff. But so how this works in practice is that. So with the initial cloning steps and stuff, we use these um, agar plates. So we have these petri dishes, which are these little um, plastic trays. You've probably seen little pictures of them. And then we fill them with this agar, which is a, like a sugar gel um, filled with bacterial food. So we call bacterial food media. Um, and so typically these are LB agar plates. When we, um, so for the cloning phase, we do that. And we have these, each colony is going to represent um, uh, like a cloning, like a, cl um, so one bacteria grows and grows and grows on top of itself and you get this globby colony. And so they should, which all the cells in it should be genetically identical. And so you take on these colonies and you grow it in this little starter culture. So typically you do it in one of these like 14 mil culture tubes or in a small like 25 or, um, mill portion of media in a little flask and so this is going to be your starter culture and you do that overnight oh it's, an, it's important that you add the antibiotics so if we look back at our plasmid i kind of skipped over this but it also has an antibiotic resistance gene so you want to grow your bacteria in the presence of the antibiotic that way only bacteria that have the plasmid will be able to grow and all the other bacteria will get killed um, so that's really important. So remember to add the antibiotic. So you let this grow overnight, and so basically you're just trying to get a robust little starter culture. And then the next morning you come in and you're going to inoculate a larger portion. So you're going to take some of that starter culture and stick it in more media so that you can grow more of it. Um, and remember to add your antibiotics again. So you typically want to add the antibiotics like just before you're going to use it so that they don't get degraded or that sort of thing. You want to add them fresh. Um, so the media can be TB, um, terrific broth, or LB, um, lysogeny broth. Um, there are some, also some other special broths, but those are the two one, main one types of media that we use. And so, like, that LB is the same thing that's in that gel dish. Um, TB is a little richer. And I have a post on that as well. So then we stick these flasks into this shaker incubator. Um, and you also, you, as you see in the pictures, like, you only want to fill the flasks, like, a quarter or so of the way full. They need plenty of room for aeration. So you need to be able to, they need to be able to swirl and have the air um, reach all the cells. So... Our goal now is to let the bacteria work for us grow. So we want to get lots of bacteria cells so that we can get them to start making our protein. We don't want to overgrow them. We don't want to stress the bacteria out by having like overpopulation where they're running out of food because that wouldn't be good. We need to have, they need a lot of, they're going to need a lot of food to make a lot of protein. And so we want to balance between lots of bacteria and not too many bacteria. And so the way that we, do this is by kind of measuring the cloudiness, which we can do um, with this spectroscope, 
spectroscoper or spectrophotometer. I can never remember the name. Spectroscopy. Um, and so we have these little cuvettes and you stick a, a sample of the bacterial media in there. And then it shines light through. And based on the how much how like cloudy it is, different amounts of light will get through, and that gives you a measurement. And you want to make sure you take a blank. So take a sample before you add the bacteria, and blank it so that your like subtract so that you set your baseline so that you're now measuring what's above that value. So initially, it's gonna grow really slow. Um, so bacteria grows exponentially, so it like doubles and then it doubles and then it doubles. So in the beginning, it seems really slow, like two to four, four but then it takes up like four to 16. So it's like the, you, you can get deceptively fooled if you just measuring in the beginning, you're like, this is never gonna grow. But then it'll really pick up. And so once it starts picking up, you need to really keep an eye on it because it'll go fast. Um, so typically I aim for about 0.6 to 0.8 for LB, 1.4 to 1.8 for TB, but um, there's different values and stuff. And so always look to see if your protein has been expressed and purified before and what the people used, because that could be helpful. So once it's at that point, I typically, um, when I do expressions, I often do it overnight. Uh, so I, at 18 degrees Celsius. So what I'll actually do is I'll co start cooling the incubator down when it's getting close to the value that I want to induce it. Um, so sometimes I'll actually like stick it on ice if it's getting too close or I'll just um, turn down the incubator and try to cool things off. Um, and then I add the IPTG. Um, so typical values are about 0.1 to 1 millimolar. Um, so yeah, so I do the overnight growth at 18C. Um, oftentimes I find that works well. Another option is to do a shorter, like three to four hour growth at 37 degrees Celsius. So 37 is what we typically grow. The, the starter cultures and when we're doing the initial growth of the larger cultures. Um, and before you add the IPTG, you want to take a pre-induction sample. So the import, you want to make sure that your protein is getting expressed, especially if you have problems with the purification and you're like, well, is it the problem like purification or is the problem that the protein didn't even get expressed in the first place? So if you have a sample before you induce the in expression and a sample after you induce the expression, you can use SDS page to um, see if, you're pro if you see a band. So unlike with like insect cell expression or mammalian cell expression where sometimes it can be really hard to even see if your protein gets expressed if it does because you're not really overexpressing it that much, with bacteria you really do overexpress it. So we're talking like 50% of the bacterial proteins could be your protein. So you need to, so you should be able to see a band on your SDS page gel if your protein got expressed. So what am I talking about with SDS page? So I'm guessing that if you've made it this far in the video, unless you're maybe like my grandma or something, you know what SDS page is. Well, hopefully grandma knows too because she watched those previous videos. But I have a video on it, but basically the idea is that you separate proteins based on their size um, by sending them traveling through this gel mesh and the bigger proteins will get tangled up more and the smaller proteins will travel further um, and so when you turn it off then um, the bigger proteins will be higher up and the smaller proteins will be lower down and that was the simplification um, but there's the video on that so I'm not going to go into all the nuances right now um, but the basic idea is you can take your pre-induction sample and your post-induction sample um, so you take a little bit of it and you mix it with liquid and um, your buffer and stuff and you get it really hot uh, spin it down yeah I have information about that on my post but you can then run a sample of this and you can see that in the post-induction sample, I have this big fat band um, that isn't present in the pre-induction sample. So yay! Yeah, so it's important that you have that post-induction sample because, um, I'm sorry, the pre-induction sample because as you can see, the bacteria has its own proteins too. So if there's a protein of like the similar size that you would expect in the pre-induction sample, you might think, or in the post-induction sample, but you don't have the pre-induction sample, you might be like, well, is that the bacteria's own protein? 
or not. Um, so the key thing here is you see a band that didn't exist before that does exist now, and it's nice and big and fat. And then hopefully once you purify it, it'll be pure too. Um, so yeah, so once your bacteria is expressed, then comes the harvesting step where you take, you want to get rid of all that media. So you have like liters in this media with a bunch of bacterial cells. But most of the stuff is actually media still. So it's just the bacteria food that the bacteria are swimming in. So you want to remove all of that. And so you, in the harvesting step, we spin it down really fast. Um, and so this is going to pellet out the cells. And then we can um, resuspend them in cleaner media. So basically we add some fresh, or not media, we add some fresh buffer, which is like pH stabilized um, salt water with some protease inhibitors so pr to prevent protein chewers from chewing up our proteins. Um, and when we break them open later. And then we, and that also, we do it in a smaller amount of liquid so we don't want to work with liters anymore. And then we put it into a little um, tube, freeze it at minus 80. Um, and store it till we're ready to do the protein purification step, which is what we talked about before. We lyse it so you break it open, then you um, separate the soluble stuff from the insoluble stuff. So before when we spun it, we were separating the cells from the media, and now we're actually separating the soluble proteins from the membrane bits and stuff. And then we can use chromatography um, to separate the proteins based on their properties and purify them out. Um, so yeah, so bacterial expression is typically like your first step go-to for protein expression because it's cheap, easy, uh, relatively easy usually, um, but it doesn't work well for all proteins, especially proteins that are larger and have like post-translational modifications. So things like glycosylation, sugar addition, phosphorylation, addition of phosphate groups, or the proteins that need help folding that sort of thing. So typically we go to more like complex cells, like eukaryotic cells. So cells that are more like our cells, they have the nuclei, they have all that stuff. Um, so I typically use um, a bacterial, I'm um, sorry, a baculovirus expression vector system, which allows me to do um, expression in insect cells. Um, so I get better luck with my proteins, but it's more time consuming. Um, and expensive but if if that's saying like if your if your protein doesn't express well in bacteria it can end up being more time consuming and expensive trying to troubleshoot all of the stuff with the bacteria um, so if you know early on that you need to use the insect cell expression it'll save you a lot of time and effort but obviously not every lab has the ability to use this system and that sort of thing because it takes more equipment and training and all of that stuff. And so a lot of times there are things you can do to try to get bacterial expression to work. And so I have a post on that too, um, if people are interested. Um, so happy expressing.